the best leaders understand the value of time and not just their time, but they care about the time of their team. I'm Nick Sonnenberg, and this is Win the Day with James Whitaker. You're listening to Win the Day with James Whitaker. What we do in life echoes in eternity. Broadcasting from Los Angeles, California, here's your host, James Whitaker. Let's go. Hey, winners. Welcome back to Win the Day. If this is your first time here, we sit down with some of the world's true change makers to give you all the tips, tools, and strategies to win the day every day. The quote for this episode comes from Dale Carnegie and says, an hour of planning can save you 10 hours of doing. Our guest today is Nick Sonnenberg, the former Wall Street trader turned operational efficiency expert. As founder and CEO of Leverage, Nick has worked with organizations of all sizes and across all industries, from high growth startups to the Fortune 10. Nick's CPR business efficiency framework results in greater output, less stress, happier employees, and the potential to gain an extra full day per week in productivity per person just by using the right tools in the right way at the right time. Nick is also an Inc. columnist, guest lecturer at Columbia University, and the Wall Street Journal best-selling author of this book that you can see sitting in front of me right now called Come Up For Air, How Teams Can Leverage Systems and Tools to Stop Drowning at Work. In this episode, we're going to talk about how Nick's role on Wall Street made him realize what was missing most from his life, the biggest things holding businesses back from true growth, how to create and leverage intellectual property, and what you can do to become an efficiency expert right now. Before we begin, the right bit of inspiration can completely change the trajectory of someone's life. So there's a friend or loved one out there who needs to hear this episode or could use some help to win the day. Share it with them right now. All right, let's win the day with Nick Sonnenberg. Nick, great to see you. Thanks for coming on the Win the Day show. Thanks for having me. How does it feel having the book out? It's a relief. It took four, that, that was four years in the making. So it's, it feels great to have it out. <laughs> and it's one of those things that you could just keep adding to and just keep tweaking oh, for yeah. life. Especially- Every time I read it in the editing process, I'm like, oh my God, we got to change this. So at some point you just got to cut it. You probably have to put blinkers on to stop any new tools from from like being put on your radar. You're like, oh, I'm trying to write something timeless and, and sort of current well, at the same time. But well, it's part tough. of the reason why it took four years is some, uh, the you know, say at the two year mark, it was still changing so much. I'm like, okay, we need to pause for a little bit here. <laughs> and it's not so much the tools changing like we're getting smarter about how to think about them use cases and best practices but once it kind of stabilized then it was more a matter of you know should we add another example cut a word cut another word so (laughs) um but yeah these things take forever as you know (laughs) they certainly do and where do you where do you learn the most is it on your own business is it working for clients businesses or just from observing what's happening in the industries Uh, a a bit of both we learn a lot from our clients but i like to think of my company leverage so we do operational efficiency training and consulting and I, i kind of view it more like a like a um think tank almost like a laboratory where we're constantly experimenting with new ways of using tools now they're obviously ai is such a big concept so how do you apply that to the tools automation new tools on the market so we're constantly tinkering internally but then sometimes clients um we can learn quite a bit from and see you know how they operate or what their needs are and then that sparks new ideas as well yeah absolutely well to take us back to your your sort of younger years is there a particular memory or or demo or moment that really defines what your childhood was like (laughs) i don't know my whole life i've always been obsessed with time uh even as a young young kid my mom's british she she's quite long-winded so even as a young kid i can remember her telling me these uh, bedtime stories and i'd just be like all right so she wore a red dress and got (laughs) ate by a pack of wolves i get it you know so I've always, even from a young age, kind of just been uh, obsessed get to, get with Get to time. the point. Yeah, 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 get to the point. <laughs> I love it. When, when did the intersection of understanding the value of time and getting ba- and getting paid based on the magnitude of the problem you solve first come on your radar? Um, well, even in college, I was able to graduate a year early because uh, at the very beginning of college, when you're kind of mapping out your courses, I kind of sat down for half a day and I'm like, okay, if I take this class, it covers three general electives. If I do this one and I was able to, um, just efficiently kind of optimize my, my, my course catalog and have four day weekends at the same time. So I started really getting more into it that, uh, at that age. Um, but then after college, I became a high frequency trader. And so for those, if, in case you're not, not sure what that is, I was developing algorithms and coding computers. Um, to trade stocks at microseconds and nanosecond speeds, all based off of math. And I knew nothing about the stocks, you know. So at a young age, I was managing billions of dollars and it was pretty cool. Um, And in that space, 
yeah, literally a microsecond can mean millions. Mm. Um, and so it was in that role, I did that for eight years. I really developed a, an even deeper appreciation for celebrating small wins. Like, you know, even if we could shave a microsecond off of how the algorithm uh, process something, that can, that can make a huge impact. So I'd started just fine tuning and strengthening this muscle of of really dissecting and breaking things down into micro components, celebrating small wins. Um, it was all automated. So then obviously uh, automation also, um, I developed a deep appreciation for that as well in that role. <laughs> I love it. You know what you mentioned there about university? So I was actually the complete opposite. You were able to graduate a year early. I ended up finishing my stuff a lot later because it was it was a very, which was very frustrating at the time. I'm not someone that lives with regrets, but if I had my time again, I would do things so differently around that, that um, going into undergrad university time. What would you do differently? It was a big lesson in understanding that you need to master the rules of the game mm-hmm. before you you play the game. Yep. And a lot of times in life, we just find ourselves playing a game and getting very frustrated, especially in the in the business world. But if we take a step back, Nick even, even applied this in relationships. If we take a step back and say, well, what are the rules of what we're trying to do here? And how can we you know, make sure this is the most efficient and effective partnership or, or venture that I'm involved in? What can we do differently? So when I saw that about your background, I was like, wow, that's such an interesting thing that you've, that you've been able to do. Well, I think that, that that's profound and applies to so many different aspects of, of life and business. Um, even as a high frequency trader, I, I think one of my strengths was um, I'd really understand the rules of the game as it relates to the stock market. Whether you know, Are you from Australia originally? Yeah, yeah. What part of Australia? From Brisbane. Oh, cool. So I used to trade the, the Australian markets as well as some, some other when I lived in Asia. And I remember at a young age, I just studied what are all the rules of the exchange, the taxes, the, 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 me- the uh, mechanics of how an order is processed on a gateway. And then from there, that once you really deeply understand end to end how something works, you could then start figuring out, you know, how do I find opportunity? But it always starts with understanding the rules of the game. And even in, in business, you know, um, having core values or core principles, those are kind of the foundational rules. And then all the little things like, okay, on Mondays, we have an all hands, like those are kind of just details that kind of are sitting on top of some core foundational base of rules and principles. Yeah, absolutely. What about, um, you know, they say the stock market is driven by fear and greed. When we're mm-hmm. talking about algorithms and AI is obviously taken all over, uh, over a lot of the um, uh, mathematical requirements of that, were you doing something separate to fear and greed or were you doing something that would leverage the emotions that you know that people are going to have? Um. <laughs> I was I was just taking advantage of mathematical discrepancies in the stock market, and sometimes those discrepancies probably uh, occur because yeah, people are are making trades or moves based off of you know fear, greed, what 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 have you. But whenever something kind of gets out of theoretical um, uh, the theoretical spreads that they should be in, that's that's where the algorithms would kick in and start placing uh, placing bets. So that's your opportunity to exploit anything that's out of the pattern yeah, that should be. I didn't normal. care. Uh, so the, the specifically the type of high frequency trading I did is called index arbitrage. Not to go on a rabbit hole, <laughs> but um, you know, there's a theoretical relationship between, say, any index future, the S and P 500, and the the stocks that make it up. And you know, there's there's tons of index. You have the Dow Jones. You have the Nasdaq. You have you know, in Australia, you have the AS 51. And so there's theoretical. Um, there's theoretical spreads between all these different things. And then there's a million other strategies that we had. But, you know, if the spread's supposed to be here and it's here, you know, you want to sell this one and buy this one, you know, Um, uh, and vice versa. So we would just take advantage of that. And what causes these spreads could be a magnitude of different things, but fear and greed uh, Mm -hmm. could be one factor that does cause things to get out of alignment. Mm, interesting. And your time on on Wall Street, I know that was around the subprime mortgage crisis, global financial crisis, a lot mm-hmm. of things going on. How did your time in that arena change how you saw the world and your role in the world? Um I think that what it what it did was it really gave me it really gave me um tools that I that I didn't realize at the time were so valuable. When I quit finance, I was worried. I was like, I- I'm a world expert at index arbitrage. How am I going to apply this to startups or anything else? But I, what I think that, um, what I think it really taught me was 
um, one hand, how to how to still think straight in stressful times. You know, what happens if you have a billion dollars pending mm. and the exchange line goes out and you don't know if you got filled and you have to make you have to try to make the best decision in the moment based off of the information at hand without just having an explosion, right? So it taught me how to uh, keep keep cool and calm under under high stress, how to be rigorous with things, how to celebrate small wins. So there was a lot of things I didn't realize at a young age, I was actually starting to learn how to be data-driven with decisions. I mean, it was all data-driven, um, the decisions that we made. So I, I think that, um, yeah, I... I started coming up in that space, you know, during the financial crisis and other, other interesting times in, in uh, history. But um, I think it was really just these kind of core principles of how to think about problem solving that I really gained. Mm, absolutely. Aside from your CPR framework, is there another process that you have in terms of being able to solve or to identify what a problem really is and the best solution to apply? Well, so my CPR framework is, is really a foundational framework for for the requirements of every team to be high performing and the different tools that are required in every company. Um, but I think at a, at a foundational or principle level, really kind of what, to what you were saying a bit earlier, what problem are we really solving here? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's easy to jump into a process and start optimizing, but should you even do that in the first place? So I think I get really, I'm, I think that I'm strong at kind of getting down to first principles with things. And what's the problem that we're really solving here? You know, what does success look like? And so oftentimes you're given something, it's like, can you fix this? And, you you know, actually it's better to throw that in the trash and start over, do something else. So I think that um, through my high frequency trading days and just now my experience, now I've been a CEO for longer than I was a trader. I think I've I've just uh, built this muscle of, of knowing how to solve a problem or optimize a process. Mm-hmm. And what about the origin story for leverage? Tell it, take us into uh, <laughs> that interesting time in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so when I got out of finance, I had, um, I jumped into startups. I had a bit of money um, at that time. I didn't have a wife or kids, still don't um, as of this recording. But I thought if, if, if there's ever a time to get into startup world, uh, now's the time. And, and, I got interested in it. I always thought I had the coolest job. You know, at a young age, I'm managing billions of dollars. I'm doing this really, I had 16 computer screens. I I thought I had the coolest job ever. And I went to the Turks and Caicos with um, my best friend, Aaron. And he was, we were sitting by the pool and he was working on a laptop. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, well, I'm running my company. Um, I'm I'm an entrepreneur. And I was like, what are you talking about? You're running your, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware that this was even a possibility. And that image just really stuck with me that he's having a pina colada, he's by a pool and he's able to work. And then it really struck me that I didn't have the coolest job that ultimately what I should be optimizing for is freedom, freedom of time, freedom of what I get to work on, who I get to work with, when I work. And so that really stuck in the back of my head. What I'm, what am I optimizing for? You know, and it's not just money, it's all these other aspects of freedom and so I eventually decided I had an idea for a startup. I got out of finance, spent about nine months on that startup. It did reasonably well. And then during that time, I was having dinner with one of my other best friends at the time. And uh, by the end of dinner, we had this idea for this new freelancer marketplace. And I said to him, look, you get five clients. I'll build the back end in a day and we'll launch on day two. It was a Sunday. I was like, let's launch this thing on Tuesday. And we did. And you fast forward a month, we're on stage at um, Genius Network. We were talking about that before, Joe Polish's um, event. And Tony Robbins was the day two speaker and we were the day three speaker. Tough act to follow. Yeah, but we <laughs> we were talking about what we're up to. And um, out of 100 people in the room, like 90, over 90 signed up for our services. So all of a sudden, within a month, we're just kind of launched into this thing and Fast forward a year and we have 150 people on the team and we're doing seven figures of revenue. We bootstrapped it and it was all all by being, you know, uh, clever with automation, uh, so have you. And all of that sounds impressive to people. But then uh, when, I t- when you look under the hood, actually, of what was going on, it was a complete mess. We, um, yes, we were doing a lot of revenue and we were getting 20% new clients in every month, but... The other side of that story is we were losing 15% of clients every month. So we were net only growing at five. 
So good marketing was masking some foundational problems with how we delivered our services. Um, we had about three quarters of a million dollars in debt and we were losing about half a million dollars a year. What was the debt from primarily from wages? Um, you know, we were operating at a loss. And so what we would do is we would kick the can and anytime we were like, okay, how are we going to make payroll? Oh, let's pre-sell more credits of services mm. for the future. Right. So we would do that to fund kind of what, uh, what our previous loss was. So, uh, one day we're having coffee and he taps me on the shoulder and he tells me he's out not in two weeks or two days. He's out in two minutes. And I sit there and I'm going white and I'm sweating. I'm like, oh, holy crap, we're going to go bankrupt. Um, because not only did we have those issues, also I was the behind the scenes guy and he was the front facing guy. So literally no clients knew who I was and maybe just a handful of team members knew who I was too. So I have to decide in this moment, do I just bankrupt the company or do I stick it out and try to fix things? And, and I imagine your mathematical brain was probably telling you shut it down, but maybe your heart said, uh, well, I, you know, we had some, we had a lot of things broken, but on a positive, you know, we, we, it's not easy to get to seven figures of revenue with, with a company. Um, and I did, I did also, I did also have a pretty clear understanding of where we were broken and what needed to be fixed. So I kind of weighed the pros and the cons. Also, I didn't think it was ethical. Like we owed three quarters of a million dollars of services to people. So if I shut it down, all these people I knew were going to get screwed out of their credit. So ultimately, um, I started just thinking to myself, why are we losing money? Where are we, where are we wasting time? Where are the inefficiencies and opportunities? And I started realizing one, our communication was broken. There was messages just all over the place. It was hard to get any work done with 150 people on the team. It was just nonstop, just pings and dings everywhere. The second thing I realized was I couldn't just click a button and know who's working on what. You have to start asking people, you know, uh, hey, hey, Diane, what are you working on? Hey, Andrew, what's what's this, what's the plan for the week? I couldn't just click a button and have like an overview of, of what's past due, what, what are the priorities. And then lastly, I knew that we had to digitize all of our knowledge. And I and I'd already done a pretty good job of that. Otherwise, we would have definitely not survived. And so... I started realizing we need to clean these things up and I started focusing on how we communicated, how we were planning on, and, and our resources. And without realizing it, it was the genesis of this CPR framework, communicate, plan and resource. But I, I started realizing that those were the things that we needed to focus on, but it was really tough. Within three months of him leaving, we lose 40% of revenue. Uh, clients and team members are leaving left and right. Bank accounts frozen. Uh, my dad's taking a second mortgage on his house to help us make payroll. Sinking you know? ship on all counts. Oh, yeah. yeah. You you know, you you think it's bad enough to move into someone's basement, try driving them to the bank to get a signed mortgage <laughs> mortgage document. So um, it was really tough. But through that forced me to get smarter and it forced me to stumble upon this framework. And then coincidentally, people started reaching out to me, asking me to consult them on their operations. And so... At that point, Leverage was a freelancer marketplace, um, but I was always more passionate with, you know, behind the scenes, like this game of mousetrap. How do we actually build this remote, high-performing, well-oiled machine? Mm -hmm. And so, I started fixing things. People started reaching out and I got to work with really cool companies. You know, Tony Robbins gave the quote for the front mm -hmm. cover. I got to work with him, Poopery, cryptocurrencies, financial advisors, big companies. And what I started realizing was everyone had the same issues at a high level. Everyone needed to communicate better. Everyone had the needs for managing tasks and projects and everyone had SOPs and processes. So I started realizing that actually kind of this strategy wasn't just applicable to me. It was applicable to every company of every size of every industry. And so that was quite interesting to see. And uh, ultimately I, I realized that the better, the bigger opportunity was not the freelancer marketplace, but to help all these businesses operate more efficiently. And if you think about how work has changed, um, it's not just remote or, or not remote or hybrid or co-located. It's we're not living in the days anymore where it's just Gmail and Outlook. Now you've got Slack and Asana and Microsoft. There's all these tools that you can leverage, no pun intended. And But no one's ever been taught how to think about all these tools. What's the purpose of each of these tools? And I started realizing that training and consulting people on best practices within these tools can totally transform the way they operate. And so we decided to pivot the company. And now the sole focus is on 
helping teams operate more efficiently. We're giving back over a day a week per employee. And that's also why I decided to write a book on this. I wanted to spread the message and help as many people as possible. My mission is to save millions and millions of hours of people's time. Yeah, I love it. The one thing people don't have, especially people with young kids, is just time. Yeah. It's such a big a big battle. Um, the fact that now you're so successful with the company, how does that help you reconcile internally the moment with your business partner leaving you? Well, I, I honestly I don't I don't give the business partner uh part uh, any thought anymore. It's mm. been such a long time ago. Um if anything, I'm grateful for the stressful situation because mm. you know, sometimes it sometimes in order to have that breakthrough, you really have to go, you you really have to go through something extreme to force you to totally break things apart and and fundamentally change every aspect of how things are doing going and rethinking the problem completely. So I'm grateful for having gone through it. I mean, it probably shaved a lot of years off my life, but <laughs> it um <laughs> it forced me to come up with this framework, which hopefully is going to save millions of hours of other people's time. Yeah, it's amazing some of those uh, moments when we find ourselves in that adversity. I mean, yeah. I've had businesses before where competition pops up and you're like, what are they doing? They're very visibly trying to eat into what we're doing. And I've had events that I've been running where people have literally copied and pasted the entire website as well. And it's like, wow, this is just incredible how brazen some of this stuff is. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote an article called The Gift of Competition, talking about how it actually brings forth your best effort because it makes you so determined to give your best well, in that in that moment. Forces you to be better, doesn't yeah, it? Absolutely. And step up your game. For sure. Uh, meetings are a big one. I had yep. something with my team where we were like, look, I actually said to my assistant, Jan, shout out, Jan. I was like, do you like doing these weekly meetings that, that we have? And do you find them really useful? And she said, not really. And then she asked me, what do I think? And I said, look, I don't, you know, particularly look forward to it either. It's something that's just annoying that we have the obligation to do. So we don't really, we have one monthly meeting for the people in my team and that's it. And it's made everything so much better and forced a lot more streamlined and centralized communication. Um, I look at other people who I'm close with. They are on calls and meetings the entire day. I don't know how they can get any work done. What is it with meetings and what can we do to, to fix them? <laughs> yeah, I mean- the the two usually the two quickest wins that and biggest costs inside of teams that are kind of invisible costs is how you use email and so like learning how to get to inbox zero is critical that could save three five hours a week but then meetings also is one of the most costly things inside of companies i was reading an article and i think it's something like 38 billion dollars a year is wasted in meetings in the u.s i think that that was the stat from last year um, and also when you think about the cost of a meeting, like everyone has an hourly rate. So I think it first starts with what's the cost of this meeting and an easy way to think of it. You know, some of your people might not be hourly, even if their salary assume 2000 hours a year working hours. So if it's a hundred thousand dollar a year person divide by 2000, it's $50 an hour roughly. And then you can make the adjustments. If it's a $50,000 a year person, it's 25. If it's a $200,000 a year person, it's a hundred and then, you know, figure it out. So, you know, if you get three people on a call for an hour that all make $100,000, you know, $50 an hour times three, it's $150 meeting that you're having there, right? So, once, first is to really understand the cost of this. You know, you have a six... Per, so, what, all, what makes a meeting more expensive? What, the, the higher the hourly rate of people, the longer the meeting, the more people you have in it. So, if there's anything that you can do there in terms of reducing, like, Maybe you don't need to cut the meeting that you had each week. Maybe instead of it being, how long was that meeting? Was it an hour or 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. Maybe you could cut it to 15 minutes and then it's less painful and, you know, relevant and you get value out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so can you cut the frequency, the number of people, the length, or maybe even cut it at all um, are the things to always be thinking about. But meetings can be really powerful if you do them right, you know? And so a couple couple things to think about is one, have an agenda so that you can stay on point. Um, you know, you don't want to like show up to a meeting and people are like, oh, what are we talking about today? Like you should have an agenda and you, you have someone making sure that you stick on point, dec decisions get logged, action items get, um, get logged as well. Agenda is also really helpful because, you know, going back to CPR, communication, you've got Slack and Microsoft Teams and all these other tools. You don't want every time someone has an idea, the worst thing is 
they just start dumping it to you in Slack or Teams and then nonstop notifications, you know? Um, so you want to have an agenda to give them a place to dump non-urgent things that can wait till next week or next month's meeting. But your brain is for having ideas, not holding ideas. So you, you have to give them a place to dump it so that they're not walking around trying to hold on to this thing. Um, so an agenda serves multiple purposes, but the best use of a meeting is for live collaboration. So as you're trying to think about what can we, how can we reduce the length or the frequency, any aspect of a meeting that could be done asynchronously, like a report out, what was your assistant's name? Jan. Jan. So say Jan has to, um, you say she's giving you a report out on the metrics of your social media and podcast from last month. That doesn't need to be live. She could pre-record that, right? Using tools like Loom or other, other ways. And she could say, it, say it's five to 10 minutes of an update on how the metrics are going. Set, record a Loom video of that. Don't, let's not talk about it live on the meeting. And you can watch it when you're in the back of an Uber or when you're going on a walk or whatever, right? So if you could just strip out all the stuff that could be done asynchronously and just focus on the synchronous part, which should be live brainstorming and or a sensitive conversation too. You don't want to asynchronously tell someone they're doing a crap job and <laughs> right but another thing to realize is it's not just about saving time it's about optimizing time time isn't linear not every hour slot on your calendar is worth the same so if you're doing those meetings at say nine o'clock or ten o'clock if your time's worth a hundred dollars an hour that time slot actually might be a thousand dollar an hour time slot right um you know monday for me monday at nine is the most valuable slot on the entire week I've just had a relaxing weekend. I woke up in the morning, did my workout, my morning shake, all that stuff. And my brain is at full horsepower at that point versus six to seven o'clock on a Friday after I've had a hundred Zoom calls and I'm tired and I'm in the back of an Uber and I don't have Wi-Fi and I don't have my laptop. That's a less valuable time slot. So the Monday at nine might be a thousand dollar an hour time slot. And the Friday at six might be a $20 an hour time slot. So if I can do a time shift and now watch Jan's video in that $20 an hour time slot, I'm, st I'm still absorbing everything I need to absorb, but I'm optimizing my time. And now I can keep that 9 a.m. Monday time slot for stuff that's co more complicated, that requires a, a bigger decision, that really needs that full horsepower. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Michael Bruce, who connected us, um, one of the big things I learned from him is finding out what are the times when you have the most energy yep. and um, making Wait. sure you do your most creative, most productive things that move your whole life's work forward rather than busy work like emails. It was a big thing for me where I, when I was um, writing the book, Thinking Grow It's a Legacy, the book before the one I gave you today, um, I was waking up, I wanted to have that feeling of achievement. So I would do things like clear out my inbox, then I would go and do a gym session and I would have nothing left in the tank in the afternoon yep. for the creative projects. And I had to move that very, very quickly because just the output, just the quality of it and and literally just how much was coming out was just not where it needed to be. Yeah, totally. And you've also had um, our mutual friend, uh, Dr. Jeff Spencer, yeah, that also talks guy. about- um, uh, you know, your peak time throughout the day. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you mentioned inbox zero there. For someone who's got like 5,000 emails sitting in their inbox, how do they clear that backlog and what are some things they can do to, to stay at inbox zero? I mean, 5,000 is nothing. I mean, like, we've, <laughs> we've, we've dealt with people with like hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Um, so inbox- Shift delete, is that the- <laughs> <laughs> Not not delete, I actually, uh, I have a whole chapter on this in the book about not, you don't, shouldn't delete anything that uh, you should be archiving. Um, but uh, there's there's two things. What is inbox zero? Inbox zero is when you go to your inbox, read or unread, you have say less than 20 or 30. Actually, you don't want to be at zero because if, if you're at zero, it means every single time you get an email, you're, you're dropping everything and dealing with it, which is counterproductive. <laughs> um, but if what is email is just an external to-do list that other people can add to. That's the way to think about, that's the mindset around email. And just like you want to knock off all the line items in your to-do list, you want to knock off, you know, your to-do list, which is your, your email. And there's three things that you can do with every email. You can reply, archive, or defer. So the framework in the book is called RAD. And um, most people are just, they don't, they don't think about their inbox that way. Um, and when you, when you keep having to process and look at the same message over and over, right, by not archiving these emails, you can't help but reread the same thing. And so whether you realize it or not, 
you're wasting a significant amount of time reprocessing stuff that's already been processed. And when you open up your inbox and you've got 10 or 20 right there, you can really focus and make, it's not just about the time savings, it's also about making sure nothing gets missed. When we work with clients, our most popular training at Leverage is teaching people how to use email properly and following this RAD system. I can't tell you how many times where people are like, look, I'm saving three, five hours a week, but I caught an email that I had missed that was worth $50,000 to me. You know, so Mm -hmm. when you don't have a grip on your email, you're missing opportunities. People also start not trusting you right? And so, this impacts culture. If if people don't get replies or don't trust that you've seen something, then they get anxiety and then they start texting you and following up multiple times. And not only is that a time waste, that's an anxiety and stress uh, impact. And it also, as a byproduct, affects culture on your team because trust comes in multiple forms. One form is, I trust that you're ethical and that you're not going to steal from me. The other is, I trust that if I give you something, you're going to do it and you're going to see it. And both both uh, dim- dimensions of trust are important in a team from a culture aspect. Absolutely. Uh, you've worked alongside some amazing business leaders, some of the best in the world you've already mentioned, uh, and you've, been, you've seen under the hood of some of their businesses and the way they run their day-to-day. What do the best leaders in the world do differently than, than other people in terms of the daily routine or, or efficiency? Um, I guess there's a few things. One, obviously... Uh, operational efficiency is something uh, that is deeply passionate to me, but I see that that a lot of the the best leaders understand the value of time and not just their time, but they care about the time of their team. You don't want, or they don't want a $100,000 a year person doing stuff that a $50,000 a year person could do. So they actively try to figure out how can we get those things off your plate? Is it that we have to, you know, you're wasting time in email, we have to train you? Is it you're doing the role of a junior person and we need to hire that person. So that's one thing is um, they understand the value of time and they're not just trying for themselves to save time, but they're actively trying to um, have each of their team do things that tap into their unique zone of genius or are at um, at the hourly rate that it should be. I right? can already see how in terms of finding meaning in work and moving away from burnout, they're some of the byproducts of what you've just 100%. spoken about already. Yeah. I mean, imagine what your company looks like if if everyone's working on things that either give them joy or tap into their superpower, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and so great leaders are really focused on that. How can they remove all the other crap from, from, their, from uh, their team's plate so they can do the best, most meaningful work of their life at that company? And then obviously they are good at setting vision, financing vision, they have developed a strong sense of culture in the company. Um, yeah, I mean, those are some of the key things I've seen. What about the process of creating intellectual property in a business? What's the best way for, for a company to go about doing that? Well, I'm a big believer in documenting. Uh, it, d- it depends what type of intellectual property. Obviously, depending on what you have, you could go and get a trademark, copyright, uh, patent, et cetera, et cetera. But... For me, also another another aspect to it is making sure that your team documents everything that they do, right? Because when you hire someone and you pay money and you invest in them figuring something out, you don't want to be at risk that if they quit tomorrow or, you know, something happens to them, you don't want all that knowledge just leaving. Like these, these things are assets to your company. If you ever exit, it's going to increase the value of your company. So you really want to make sure that Everything's getting captured in a smart way because I've seen a lot of people just capture everything, but it's disorganized and then actually it hurts you. <laughs> so, uh, but you you don't want to be at risk of anyone leaving, but also documenting these things helps new hires get up to speed. It helps people self-answer questions so they don't have to distract people. Mm. And like I said before, it, it increases the valuation of your company. Mm. Once you start to create and identify a lot of that IP, what are some of the best ways that people can can leverage that? Well, you want to store it in in some common cloud-based tool like Coda, Notion, like the one of those types of knowledge bases or processes. You want to put it in something like Process Street, but you want to put it in a in a place where everyone knows where to look. 
Because, you know, to really get value out of these things, people have to be able to find it. Yeah. That's one of the bigger things I got from your book as well. It's so simple, but all these wasted minutes just trying to do that. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know about you, but if I'm in that really high power creative mind and I need to find something and I can't get it, it is so frustrating. And it just kills your energy if you can't get access it to is, it. And it is. And it, look, everyone's busy. I called my book Come Up for Air because everyone's drowning in work. So if you're already working 12 hours in a day or four, whatever the, the, the thing is, you know, and you've just created some asset, um, it, it is hard to motivate someone to drop everything else that needs to be done by end of day and spend a minute to go and put it in the knowledge base in the right section in a nice clean way. And so, but if you, if forever you don't do that and everyone's in that scenario, you never... You never build up that asset for yourself where you have one place to look. Mm -hmm. And so you really need to build into the culture that, you know, people should take pause and put things where it belongs. Like the underlying principle of all of this stuff is to have a high performing team, you need to be optimizing for being able to retrieve information fast, not transfer information fast. And that's kind of the underlying principle that I realized is the key to unlocking efficiency across an entire organization. For someone who's watching this and they're just drowning, they're like, I would love to have a bird's eye view and think about all these different things I can implement, yeah. but I just don't have any spare minutes. Aside from going and grab a copy of your awesome book, what else should they be doing right now just to to get a leg up to start moving forward a little bit? Uh, well, yeah, the, the book is obviously a, a really good start. Analyze the meetings, I would say. that co- that There's no fancy new tools. This is just kind of a new way of thinking, but anything that doesn't need to be done synchronously you don't have to necessarily even cut the meeting. Just an hour meeting, maybe it could be 45 minutes. That's a huge win. Like think about if you're a team of 10, you know, and you have a weekly meeting, you know, and you cut 15 minutes, it starts to really add up when you're looking at what the impact is across the entire organization. Extra time for every single person who would have been attending. Yeah. So um, I would first start with, you know, what meetings can you do every other week instead of weekly? Does everyone need to be on it? Could you cut it a little bit shorter? And People send an update, either a video or written. Yeah. Uh, The next thing I would do is get a grip on email. Um, One of the things with emails, it takes, even if you have 100,000 emails, within a few hours, you could get that down to to zero and understand going forward how you never get back into that situation and keep it at zero. Mm -hmm. And again, zero zero is in that, you know, 10 to 20 to 30 range. Um, But... Email and meetings are the two quickest wins. A beauty with email is even if the rest of your team doesn't adopt this inbox zero methodology and that RAD uh, framework, reply, archive, defer, even if they don't, as long as you do, you get the benefit because email is a single user um, activity. Like if you have a good grip on your email, you get the full benefit. Some of the other tools that I mentioned in the book, like Slack or Asana or some of these others, these require coordination amongst the team. You know, if I assign you a task and you're not using Asana, you know, I'm not going to be able to really get the full value out of Asana. It's like, what's the value of a cell phone if I'm the only person in the world that owns a cell phone? Got no one to talk to, right? So, um, so email is a single, you, you get the full value as long as you adopt the right uh, principles. So these other tools just take a bit longer because you have to get buying and coordination amongst mm-hmm a network of people. So email and inbox, those are two quick wins. Probably save you half a day a week right there if you if you do that properly. Absolutely. I've noticed with emails for the ones that sort of sit there, and I'm usually very good. I'm actually a lot better on emails than I am on text messages. Well same. Yeah. You know, sometimes you feel like a text is interrupting your day and all the notifications on your phone. I just can't stand it. But emails, I can see it when I want it. I can I can have that distance. But every email that just sits there in the inbox, as I'm reading it for the 50th time I'm I'm drafting a reply in my head, inevitably move on to something else. And gee, it's such a brain drain, isn't it? Well, the D in, in uh, RAD is defer, hmm. right? Which which is snoozing. So in Gmail, you have it natively built in and Outlook, depending on the version you have it, or you have to use Boomerang or one of these third-party tools. But you can't snooze a text like you can in an email. And it's very, very powerful, right? So say you emailed me driving directions to um, to the studio today right? I mean, we've been planning this for months, haven't we? I didn't need that email in my inbox for three months. I needed it this morning, right? So I snoozed it to the morning of today. And so 
when I woke up, popped right back up it's to the top. Ready when you need it, yeah. Right when I need it, and I see where we're going. I, I you know any 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 other relevant information, and then I was good to go, right? So deferring is something that no one, most people, ninety nine percent of people aren't currently doing in their in their email, and it's massively valuable. And also, when you defer, if there's any update to the email, it deactivates the defer and it goes straight to the top. So if you're writing to a, a client and you want to be guaranteed if they don't reply, you want to know in a week and you want it coming back to the top. But if they do reply on day three, it goes to the top on day three. So there's so many use cases of snoozing that people just aren't taking advantage of. For sure. Uh, I would love to know with just the way that you think about the world, how do you set goals and then ha- like in terms of like long term, medium, long term things, as well as uh, your daily routine? So you can pick whichever one you want to you want to start with daily routine and long term goals. What's your what's your process for, for the, thinking about those? Well, I think with with long term goals, uh, as the world becomes more volatile, I'm I'm shortening kind of what I call a long term <laughs> goal. Right. Like I think what used to be the three year. Long term used to be maybe three years. Now maybe it's like six months or a year. You I don't know? think the world can survive another American election cycle. We'll, yeah, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Um, well, for the most part, you know, uh, uh, what I like to think about with goals is, you know, at some time period of the future, looking back, what needs to have happened for me to feel like I made mean- meaningful progress professionally and personally, and so I'll start thinking about that. You know, in a year from now, what needs to have happened? For me to have said, hey, I had a really good year. You know, and that that could be different for you versus me. Um, and that's like a pretty good framework that that usually is a is a baseline to to kick off, you know, where I start setting goals. But it's more for me milestones versus goals. A lot of things could happen um in between, but it is good to have a North Star for yourself and your team. In terms of um in terms of kind of my daily routine. I travel quite a bit, so it could it, can, it changes depending on I'm in <laughs> New York, which is my home base. But in general, I'll wake up about five thirty. I'll do um, I'll do yoga, and then I'll go to CrossFit and um, have my morning shake. Uh, I try to block my mornings uh, as much as possible for me, and start start calls later. It doesn't always happen, but I typically don't do calls until at least about ten o'clock. Um, Sometimes there's exceptions, but um, so after I do my yoga and uh, my CrossFit and my shake, I'll I'll go into my email and and get back to zero and um, kind of plan out my day. Mm, I love it. Um, of all the clients that you have helped, is there a particular transformation that you are most proud of that's happened for them as a business or for them as an individual? Yeah, uh, we we worked with a large distribution company, and the CEO is a great guy, and now a dear friend, Mark Mark Bonner, and um, it, he he was he's now the chairman. He was the CEO of L and R Distributors, and one thing that made that such a, a powerful and impactful engagement was he was he was so bought in uh, for any transformation in a company, whether it's efficiency, culture, it can't it has to be from the top down. It can't be. Uh, do as I say, not as I do. And so what made it so, uh, I mean, obviously we did a great job and, you know, I have a great team, but also he he really was a um, promoter of this to his team and really said, look, guys, we're doing this. And it's not always the case where the CEO will take such a stance and such a, um, such a passion for the efficiency, but he firsthand saw the impact and he's like, guys, like, this is the way that we operate. There's no if you don't want to do it, you just just leave. Um, <laughs> Good that. I but you know, we yeah. were you know the typical you know half day to full day a week per per employee. But also, um, I forget the dollar amount, but it was in the I think it was it was pretty substantial. I think like tens of millions of of a deal they were able to land that um, they put a they they put a lot of emphasis that they felt they landed the deal because they were up against a few other companies. But the way they presented to them on how they were going to execute on it, um, they did it in this tool, Asana. I talk about it a lot in the book. It's a work management tool. And they laid out the game plan in this beautiful Gantt chart. And it really it really showed that they had a, a strategy that, that was well thought out. And I think it gave, gave the person on the other side, um, 
it, it gave them the the trust in them that these guys are going to be able to execute on it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, running the podcast. So I've worked with a lot of podcasters and business owners who want to grow using a podcast. Consistency is the absolute mm-hmm. killer for people. It's the reason I think the statistic is that there's more than 80% of podcasts have fewer than seven episodes, seven or fewer episodes. And um, it's probably the same with YouTube channels and everything. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, people who start a blog, people who go and do all those different yeah. things. So when someone schedules something, we use Calendly, which will talk to Asana, which will talk yeah. to G Drive, which will send yeah. all of these automated emails, all those different things up. Um, Slack, everyone knows what needs to be done. And without that, I mean, it's a game changer in terms of efficiency. So for people, and, and consistency is essential yep. in in any business if you want to mm-hmm. if you want to grow, right? Well, what you're bringing up uh, makes me think about the difference between saving and investing time, right? Um, so to set that stuff up probably took more than five minutes. It probably took hours of time and tinkering, and you probably changed it a thousand times like along the way, but. I would call that an investment of time, not a spend of time. Just like you can spend and invest money, you can spend and invest time. And so you invest the time setting that up because on the back end of that, you've now created a process that every podcast guest that you have, you're saving maybe 10 minutes or 30 minutes, except whatever have you. But once you kind of invest that initial time of the 50 hours or whatever it took or 10 hours, whatever it took. If every time after that you're saving an hour an episode uh, to do the bookings, well, if it took you 20 hours to set that up and now you're saving an hour, after 20 episodes, you're in the in the positive with that investment, mm-hmm. right? And so, um, it's, it's just an interesting way. People don't think enough about saving versus investing time. An example I also use is, um, imagine you have this sink that's broken and water is overflowing. A lot of people just take out the mop and start mopping up the floor. Say it takes you a minute to mop the floor or an hour to patch the pipe. You know, a lot of people, uh, it's just quicker to do to, to mop it. And sure, in the moment it is quicker, but if every day you got to spend a minute after 60 days, you'd have been better off patching the pipe. So a lot of these things that we're talking about here, you have to be willing to do that investment, but knowing that you're that after a certain period of time, you're going to be saving in perpetuity X minutes or hours, and you have a break-even point after a certain time. And so, of course, things come up. There might be an urgent deadline. And you just can't patch the pipe today. Mm-hmm. But you have to be aware that you're making a conscious choice, and you can't always just take out the mop because if you do, you are signing up for a life of just mopping. Mm. My, it's, it's so well said. My uh, focus with the podcast, every single episode that comes out, I've had this focus now for longer than two years, so for longer yep. than half the podcast, after I realized how tough the consistency aspect was, yep. is what can I do to produce episodes faster yep. and what can I do to make sure the quality of the final output is better? Mm-hmm. Every episode, I think about that and we sit down and, and plan that. And it's such an interesting way of, of doing it. Without that, you're in for big sure. trouble. And also- um, uh, so do you have a documented process of how you run the podcast? I can, I'll walk you through it. It is, it is, yeah, it is really, yep. really lengthy. Yeah. 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 And where, what kind of tool are you documenting this process, uh, this podcast in? Yeah. So when, um, Asana is, is the big one, but I have templates for literally everything. So like for, for our interview, it yep. would, all this stuff would get, would get fed in. All yep. this stuff is just templates and everything. We got Google doc, Google drive, Asana, Slack. Right. Yeah. Calendly. Right. Uh, So like that's an asset back to the conversation around assets. Like you've invested a tremendous amount of money, time, attention, money, resources into figuring out, you know, the best way of producing a podcast. And so that's an asset that's valuable to you. And now because you've invested that time, every podcast, not only is it smoother and faster, but you'll have less errors. Sometimes Sometimes just avoiding that one error, you know, if you forgot to email me the instructions to here today, like that would be a costly error, even if it's one error out of a hundred steps. So, so it's not just about saving, saving time, you know, through automation, other things, it's also indirectly saving time by avoiding an error that, that occurs that sometimes that one error could set you back hours, mm. right? And, and I see people who take automations a little bit too far. They get lazy with it, so everything becomes too standardized. I think mm-hmm. where you can, injecting that personal touch, especially with other people that you're meeting for the for the first time, I think it's really important to do that. Well, automate what you can automate, you know, like a, like a calendar reminder or something like that, that, you know, could be automated, but 
maybe your process is this step we automate. This step is a personal message that you purposely don't automate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, final question before we move into the rocket round. On your best day, what's an affirmation that you could write on a flashcard to show yourself on your worst day? <laughs> that I'm human. Mm. Yeah, I love you it. Know, I think sometimes when you, I like to consider myself a high performer. I, I put, I, I set high standards for myself. So, so inevitably I'm not hitting all of my goals or everything I'm trying to achieve. And sometimes it's easy to forget um, that you're still a human and that's normal to not always hit it. For sure. Especially especially in the crazy world that we're, that we're yeah. living in at the moment. Well, let's now move into the rocket round. 10 questions for some quick answers. You up for this one? Yeah, let's go. Number one, what quote inspires you the most? David Allen uh, wrote a book called Getting Things Done. He's a friend. um, And he was really like the father of productivity. Um, And individual productivity is necessary, but not sufficient for teams to be productive. That's my quote. That's not the quote I'm about to give you. (laughs) But um, I'm really passionate about about team productivity, but still his book was foundational. And he had a quote. I don't know if it was in the book or if we just talked about it once, but it's that your brain is for having ideas, not holding ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think so much of my content and the frameworks that I developed is with this principle in mind. Like, how do I set up a system or a process or a strategy so that you know exactly what drawer or what bucket to dump that thing into, that piece of information, so now you don't have to be think clinging onto it in your brain and you can move on to the next thing. So big. Removing that clutter. <laughs> such, a, such a big yeah. one. Uh, number two, morning coffee or evening wine? Morning coffee. Number three, what's one bit of advice you would give your 18-year-old self? I would say um, I get two things. Uh, get better at coding. <laughs> I didn't get good at coding. I think coding is a good thing. I think I, I got really strong at process um, because learning how to code teaches you a lot around process and how to think. Um, but also um, be a bit more well-rounded. I got I got really strong at math, coding, engineering. And I've had to learn some of these softer skills later on in life. So it would have been good to have done a little bit of marketing, a little bit of public speaking and these things that I've had to learn in my 30s. <laughs> I love it. Uh, number four, what book do you gift the most apart from your own? Oh, I was going to say my own. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, getting things done, I like. Tim Ferriss's four-hour work week. My friend Ben Hardy uh, wrote a great book, um, Who Not How. That's a good book. Yeah, with Dan Sullivan. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Great book. Great concept. Uh, number five, is there a vulnerability you once hid within that became your superpower? Hmm. I think admitting being wrong. I think I, I, I think I had a, always a tough time admitting that I was wrong. And I think now um, I still struggle with it. But I think I think just saying, yeah, hey, I was, I was wrong here um, is a strength. Hmm. Number six, what's one thing you've learned about failure? <laughs> That you can learn a lot from it. <laughs> Number seven, if you could sit on a park bench and have a conversation with someone alive or dead, who would it be? Mm, probably Steve Jobs. Mm, any questions you'd ask? I would really just want to understand more his thinking and understand what's, what's, what's your creative thinking process. Mm-hmm. What's your morning routine? Mm-hmm. Um, how did you come up with some of these ideas? Mm-hmm. Number eight, what tool or resource best helps you run your life or your business? Oh. We've got a whole book on- uh, <laughs> Yeah, you have to read the book. Uh, uh, email and Asana are kind of the two most used tools for me. Mm. And number nine, share one thing on your bucket list. I'd love to do a safari in Africa. Mm. And final question, number 10, what's one thing you do to win the day? Oof. I think that morning routine, waking up at 5.30, doing a double yoga and CrossFit, mm. uh, that, that just gets my brain firing at full horsepower and the next- what I can do for the following few hours after that, you know, I, I probably uh, don't have to work for the rest of the day after those first few hours. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I've never heard anyone else mention that. I think it's so important. I'm exactly the same. I feel like those well-used, high creative hours, you can do more in three hours than most people can do in an entire week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yep. so true. Um, well, there are a bunch of ways to connect with Nick, and we'll link to all of these in the show notes. You can follow him on Instagram at Nicholas Sonnenberg. Visit his website, getleverage.com, and grab a copy of his new book, Come Up For Air. Uh, and grab a copy of his new book at comeupforair.com. Again, all that and more will be linked in the show notes. Nick, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Win The Day podcast. We want to hear your thoughts on what we covered today, so drop a comment on the YouTube version of this episode with your favorite takeaway, any questions you have, or what action you'll be taking as a result of what was shared in this episode. 
And if you found value in the Win The Day podcast, leave a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You'll find a link to both of those in the show notes. It'll only take you a few seconds and more ratings really helps other people discover the show so they can get the mindset upgrade they need and we can bring more winners into the Win The Day movement. That's all for this episode. Get out there and win the day. Until next time, onwards and upwards, always.